Washing Tech. Too often people feel like, oh, well, the decision was made by the computer. I just have to, you know, sit back and, and let it be. No, we can contest those decisions. Are you worried about your kids' safety on the internet? We are here to help. Washing Tech's five-step checklist will take you through the process of protecting your kids. And will give you tips on how to set up the best parental controls for your children on their devices. You want what's best for your children. They deserve to be safe online. Our step-by-step guide will help you make sure they are. Download Washing Tech's online safety checklist today to protect your kids online. Find it at protectyourkids.online. That's protectyourkids.online. Welcome, tech policy leader. You are about to embark on a journey into the world of technology policy. Here, you will have insider access to the planet's most authoritative voices working to promote innovation, protect citizens from harm, and most importantly, ensure the forces controlling information respect democratic values. Hold on to your seat as you soar through cyberspace, guided by influential voices in the field who are here to lead you on a journey of discovery. Your mission is to learn what it takes to keep our virtual world safe, how to manage content responsibly, and defend the universe against technological threats that could disrupt our civilization. Please enter the flight deck. I guess today is Meredith Broussard. She's an associate professor at the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute at New York University, research director at the NYU Alliance for Public Interest Technology, and author of several books, including Artificial Unintelligence, How Computers Misunderstand the World, and More Than a Glitch, Confronting Race, Gender, and Ability Bias in Tech, which is the subject of our discussion today. Meredith Boussard. <laughs> Meredith, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. It's wonderful to have you on. And, you know, the last time you were on the show was back in 2019 when I, were there people, there weren't many people still at that time doing podcasts. I mean, there were a lot of them, but in this space, there weren't many. Uh, but, I mean, it seems like ages ago because it was before COVID. Yeah, before COVID seems like another era, doesn't it? Yeah, it's just, it's it's it really just changed everything. And you and I have both been around long enough to see all of these different changes that have happened. You know, the start of the internet, and then, you know, we had September 11th, we had the global financial crisis, COVID, Trump. <laughs> you know, it feels like one of the things about the pandemic is that it made everybody who was kind of still holding out, it made them get really, really comfortable with technology really fast. And so, you know, it feels like talking about technology today and talking about AI today is something that feels really normal in a way that in 2019, like it was still kind of a, you know, small percentage of folks who were having really serious conversations about technology in everyday life. Yeah, I remember we were discussing in silos. Mm -hmm. So tell us about tell us about what you've been up to in all of your research. I think you were a you've changed your position at NYU. I think you were in a different role there back in 2019. Yeah. So then I was an assistant professor. Uh, so I have since been promoted. I'm now an associate professor at NYU at the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute. Uh, and I also serve as the research director at the NYU Alliance for Public Interest Technology. Uh, and the really exciting news is that I have a new book out. Uh, it comes out March 14th, and it's called More Than a Glitch, Confronting Race, Gender, and Ability Bias in Tech. Yeah, there's a lot going on on this topic, and we talked briefly about it back in 2019. We had Lydia X. E. Brown on the show from CDT on here talking about that as well, a recent report uh, that you did. So give us a quick, uh, give us a quick synopsis of, of your book, 
you know, tell us about what you found. Sure. The book is uh, is about kind of thinking through the very complicated issues of race, gender, and ability bias and how they manifest inside technological systems. Uh, so we tend to uh, see, you know, problems of, say, something like ChatGPT being racist, and we tend to refer to it as a glitch, as a blip that is uh, easily fixed and addressed. But what I'm arguing is that it's not actually a glitch that these automated systems uh, discriminate by default. So the idea of discrimination by default is something that comes from Ruha Benjamin's really terrific book, Race After Technology. And when we start to look for the problems of the real world inside automated systems, we find them really easily. So what I'm saying with the book is that we need to move past the idea that computers are our salvation. We need to look at the way that real world problems of structural discrimination are reflected in our automated systems. And we need to anticipate these problems so that we can reduce harm. You know, one of the hardest things to do as a, uh, as a nonprofit uh, looking for funding, especially in a difficult environment, is trying to balance uh, the public interest against, you know, where you're seeking funding. And so I think a lot of times when you, know, you have corporate funders, you tend to sort of toe the line uh, in terms of trying to be optimistic about technology and then being realistic at the same time. And uh, it's, it's, it's quite stressful um, because you want to be authentic but it's not as simple as it might be uh, working in a university when you where you can rely on tuition and things like that. Well, I think funders have uh, have had a kind of techno optimistic view for a really long time, uh, and you know there was funding for a very long time for moonshot kind of projects. Uh, that is not, uh, and we've seen that moonshots only work in certain situations. I mean, the the government right now, is, U.S. government is investing in a cancer moonshot. I think that's fantastic. Uh, you know, but a moonshot in terms of, okay, let's, uh, I can't even think of like all the, all the weird technology ideas I've seen through the years. Uh, like just completely unworkable, uh, goofy, technology ideas that have gotten funding. And, you know, we need to fund weird stuff, weird experimental stuff sometimes, but we're at a point now where uh, we also need to be funding really practical ideas. Um, and so this is one of the uh, reasons I'm really excited about the new field of public interest technology. Uh, that field uh, is something that I write about in the book. Uh, it's one of the uh, kind of positive hope for the future things that I write about. And public interest technology is just what it sounds like. It's technology in the public interest. So maybe sometimes it's about uh, making a website work better so that people can file uh, unemployment benefit, un file applications for unemployment benefits in a timely manner. Uh, sometimes it's about being critical of, uh, say, facial recognition uh, software used in policing. Um, and of course, we are, you know, probably most listeners are familiar with the way that facial recognition software is uh, is biased against people with darker skin. It's better at recognizing people with light skin than people with dark skin. It's better at recognizing men than women. And uh, it does not uh, recognize trans and non-binary folks at all. Uh, so there are problems embedded in computational systems. We need to talk more about that. In terms of what corporations can do, uh, one of the things that I write about is a process called algorithmic auditing. Uh, algorithmic auditing is something that uh, kind of derives from the compliance world. I realized I just said a whole bunch of things there that might sound really boring, but stick with me. Uh, Algorithmic auditing is the process of looking at algorithms to figure out how they could be causing harm or how they could be violating the law. 
So when you're excessively optimistic, you just pretend that you know, an algorithm is more objective, more unbiased, more fair. If you are being realistic, uh, if you are not being a techno chauvinist, you look at an algorithm, you say, well, this algorithm likely discriminates by default. I need to look at the inputs and the outputs in order to evaluate uh, where problems might be happening. And it takes a lot of courage to do that. It takes a lot of courage to look at a program you've written and say, this might have some flaws. And we need to have really difficult conversations about equity, uh, about race, about gender, about ability, uh, about how this computer program that we've spent all these millions of dollars on uh, and invested all this time in might not be operating exactly the way that we expect. You know, Chat GPT was the guest on last week's show. I took the uh, I took their uh, output and put it into a, a text to audio generator that sounds like um, Sir David Attenborough. <laughs> uh, that sounds really fun. But one of the things that it kept talking about was kind of delegating this responsibility to humans to quality control the outputs, as opposed to engineers. Um, no, I, I, you know, it did mention the the role of engineers in kind of making making sure that those biases aren't there and relying on various inputs to to quality control the algorithms before they're uh, deployed. Uh, but the, I, I think the 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 question you raise is interesting because you know you've been focused on sort of too much on what users need to do to make sure the data is accurate. And when it comes to misinformation, you know, humans are, are fallible just like algorithms are fallible. And I think we're in this place now where we're not, we're not holding uh, technology accountable for, you know, types of thinking that, that humans are, are held accountable for. You know, I'm also tired of this idea of uh, personal responsibility for technology, like the idea that every user has to do this, you know, this extremely sophisticated vetting of information when it comes in the door. Like there is a lot that could be done at a platform level uh, to make, uh, you know, to make large language models less toxic, to, you uh, you know, to kind of protect more from misinformation. Um, because when you put the individual responsibility onto users for like absolutely freaking everything, the the tools become less useful. You know, so the curatorial function uh, of, you know, something like an encyclopedia is, you know, is really helpful. So let's turn to an excerpt. So I'll give the floor to you to give us a, an inside view. This is an excerpt from the first chapter of the book. Coping with the uncomfortable fact that technology discriminates is remarkably like the coping skills required to live in a racist, sexist, ableist society. The book comes from my work as a writer and a computer scientist, as well as my involvement in the wide ranging field known as artificial intelligence or AI ethics. I'm a professor of data journalism at New York University. Data journalism is the practice of finding stories and numbers and using numbers to tell stories. I talk, I write, I build software, I run data experiments. I explain carefully what I'm doing and I teach people how to do the things that I'm doing. My disciplinary home is in journalism, but I work in an interdisciplinary manner. I do a lot of public speaking about tech and social issues, often under the umbrella of what's called data ethics, critical technology studies, or public interest technology. My goal is always to help people expand their thinking about the future of tech and society. One of the examples I rely on to explain how tech is biased is the case of the racist soap dispenser. I try, sorry, it's a good example so of why tech recording. is not this neutral is an and why the, the intersection of race and technology can reveal hidden truths. The racist soap dispenser first bubbled up into public consciousness in a 2017 viral video. In it, a dark-skinned man and a light-skinned man try to use an automatic soap dispenser in a men's bathroom. The man's light skin goes first. He waves his hand under the soap dispenser and the soap comes out. The man with dark skin goes next. 
He waves his hand under the soap dispenser and nothing happens. The viewer might think it could have been a fluke, right? Maybe the soap dispenser broke or ran out of power exactly at that moment. Well, the man with darker skin gets a white paper towel, shows it to the camera, and waves it under the soap dispenser. And the soap comes out. Then he waves his own hand under the sensor again, and again, nothing comes out. The soap dispenser only sees light colors, not dark. The soap dispenser is racist. To a viewer with light skin, this video is shocking. To a viewer with dark skin, this video is confirmation of the tech bias they've struggled with for years. Every kind of sensor technology, from facial recognition to automatic faucets, tends to work better on light skin than on dark skin. The problem is far more than just a glitch in a single soap dispenser. This problem has its historical roots in film technology, the old school technology that computer vision is built on. Up until the 1970s, dark skin looked muddy on film because Kodak, the dominant manufacturer of film developing machines and chemicals, used pictures called Shirley cards to tune the film processing machines in photo labs. The Shirley cards featured a woman with a white woman with light skin surrounded with, surrounded with bright primary colors. Kodak didn't tune the photo lab equipment for people with darker skin because its institutional racism ran so deep. The company began including a wider range of skin, skin tones on Shirley cards in the 1970s. While this was the decade in which black stars like Sidney Poitier rose to greater prominence, the change wasn't the result of activism or a corporate diversity push. Kodak made the change in response to its customers in the furniture industry. The furniture manufacturers complained that their walnut and mahogany furniture looked muddy in catalog photographs. They didn't want to print color catalogs, switching from their previous black and white catalogs unless the brown tones looked better. Kodak's sense of corporate responsibility manifested only once it stood to lose money from its corporate clients. Most people don't know the history of race and technology, and sometimes they blame themselves when technology doesn't work as expected. I think the blame lies elsewhere. I would argue that we need to look deeper to understand how white supremacy and other dangerous ideas about race, gender, and ability are embedded in today's technology. Once we acknowledge this, we can reorient our production systems in order to design technology that truly gets us moving in the direction of a better world that's beautiful writing thank you why well, can't but i just want to go back to the way things were before remember when you manually with the 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 this there was like a pink soap inside a plastic <laughs> thing and then you press underneath exactly like, why can't exactly. we just do that again we're in the late stage of a pandemic i think everybody should have access to as much soap as they possibly want yeah yeah all right, so we'll take a break and then uh, we'll come back and, and hear some more of your thoughts. So what are you, what else are you reading and, and watching these days, uh, Meredith, that's inspiring you? Well, the book is, is uh, one of the ways you can read this book is as a love letter to people who I really admire in, uh, in this critical technology space. Uh, some of the, uh, some of the people who are publishing, who I will read absolutely every word that they write. Um, are people like uh, Julia Anglin, Joy Bolamwini, Timnit Gebru, Rediet Abebe, uh, Virginia Eubanks, Kathy O'Neill, Safia Noble, Ruha Benjamin, or Charlton McElwain. Uh, I'm part of a group uh, based 
sort of out of NYU called the Center for Critical Race and Digital Studies, uh, which has a lot of really amazing scholars who are working on uh, issues at the intersection of technology and society. Uh, so I really recommend reading everything put out by uh, CRDS scholars. What are some final ideas you'd like to leave with the audience before we close and Tell us where we can find you online. So you can find me online at meredithbroussard.com uh, and I am Mayor Broussard on uh, most of the usual platforms. Uh, and what I would uh, what I would love is if people uh, buy the book, read the book and feel really activated and feel really empowered to speak up when, uh, when you see a technology that is, uh, that is, harming people or is excluding people or is making a decision that you find unjust. So uh, too often people feel like, oh, well, the decision was made by the computer. I just have to, you know, sit back and, and let it be. No, we can contest those decisions. We can protest bad decisions that are made by algorithms. And that's the way that we're going to make it toward a better world. Meredith Broussard is data journalist and Associate Professor at the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute at NYU. Meredith, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks so much.